Happy May 4th, everybody. I'm Henry R. Mockingbird, your host with the mustache. If you happen to stumble across my top 10 worst things in the Star Wars sequels, you might have assumed that I hate all Disney Star Wars, which is not true. I like The Mandalorian, I'm looking forward to the Ahsoka show, and I even liked Obi-Wan Kenobi, despite its more than obvious flaws. One show I think is the best show underneath The Mandalorian is Andor. And while I was watching Andor for the first time, I couldn't help but notice some similarities to the sequel trilogy. So in this video, I'm going to count down the top eight ways that Andor succeeds where the sequels fail. So sit back and relax. You are right back in the mess. Number 8. Dr. Quattlepod looks like Mas Kanata. A young rebel fighter named Menic gets flung across and gets crushed while Kazian and the other rebels are trying to escape. They try to get Nemec to a doctor. But unfortunately, he doesn't make it. Is it just me, or does the doctor look familiar? Who does he look like? Um, hmm. Oh, I know. He looks like Mascanada from Force Awakens. Yeah, he does look like Mascanada. You are right back in the mess. Number 7. B2EMO has a more original design than BB-8. Droids have been with Star Wars since the beginning. From iconic ones like C-3PO and R2-D2 to more present day ones like K-2SO. But the one I want to focus on is... B21MO, aka B. I want to compare him to another droid, BB8. More particularly, their design and how they look different. BB8 is more shiny, it looks more like another certain droid. Hmm. R2D2. Anyone? BB-8 looks exactly like R2-D2. The main difference being is that he has a hamster wheel to move around in. He also looks shiny and smooth, as opposed to B-2, who looks more boxy. And unlike BB-8, who basically made a bunch of beeping sounds... B2 actually has a voice and can communicate with it rather well. And you really connect with him because he feels like a part of the family. You are right back in the mess.
number six. Better world building. Love him or hate him, one thing you cannot deny is that the sequel trilogy sucked when it came to world building. Compare this in stark contrast to the prequels, which excelled at world building. Expanding on the universe that the original trilogy took place in. The problem with the sequels is that it did little to explore its imaginary world. The closest we get to something like that in the sequel trilogy is the casino scene on Cano Bite. But that scene is so pointless, you could have written it out and you would have lost nothing outside of a pretty cool scene. But even then, it's so weird and over the top, it feels like something from The Great Gatsby. This is where Andor comes in. In Andor, we see people eating and drinking. Also get to see the way people live, like on Ferrix it's more ancient, as where our antagonist lives, Cyril lives in a more modern looking quarters. We see Luthen on the Star Wars equivalent to a bus or a metro. They show us Cyril in the Star Wars equivalent to a transportation hub. We see Cassian laying low in a beach town. These things may be small on surface level, but they do add a lot to Star Wars. Because you can imagine yourself being there. You are right back in the mess. Andor does the message of found family better. First things in the Star Wars sequels video I stand by, but there's one I have changed my mind on. And that is somewhat regarding Rey. In fact, what did I say in that video again? She never changes. She never learns. Throw that statement in the dumpster, will ya? Because to say that Ray doesn't learn anything or doesn't change is not exactly true from a certain point of view. Because she does go through a character arc in both The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. We see her marking down the days until her parents come back. She tries to find father figures in both Han Solo and Luke Skywalker. But as Maz points out, Dear child, I see your eyes. You already know the truth. The belonging you seek is not behind you. It is ahead. And by the end of The Last Jedi, she finally finds what she's been seeking in the resistance learning that the people who are the closest to you can be your family you could make the argument that that is the message of the last jedi not failure is the greatest teacher the problem is that rise of skywalker ends up throwing this message out the window. Again, this is where Andor comes in. Asian, very much like Ray, is looking for his lost family. In this case, his sister. 
we see him living on a planet called Canari with his sister. We also get to see how he was adopted by Marva. She pretty much saves his life and takes him to her planet known as Ferex and or highlights their relationship as there is a love and trust amongst the two. The point where it's cemented in your mind that these two are mother and son. You can see and really feel the love between the two. You are right back in the mess. Number four. The Empire is more intimidating than the First Order. This is the second and probably last time I'm going to talk about the First Order. They suck as villains, and they're boring as all hell. The only villain in the First Order who comes closest to being anywhere near threatening is General Hux, and he's only threatening in The Force Awakens. Again, this is where Andor comes in. We get to see the Empire in their prime. We get to see the way that they torture their victims, which is really screwed up, and the way they run their prisons. They can fry their prisoners just by pushing a button. Even the villains in Andor are a huge improvement, like Cyril. He is a creep. He's always slithering around and annoying people to no end. And then we have Dedramira, our main villain, who is sharp and is pure evil. Not a shred of kindness is in her. Who can I compare her to? I guess I could compare her to the screaming jackass that is Kylo Ren, but no, that's hanging fruit. Instead, I'll compare her to a character who I did not bring up in my top 10 worst things in the Star Wars sequels, Phasma. And why didn't I bring up Phasma in that video? Well, to put it simply... I forgot she was even in Force Awakens in The Last Jedi. She left so little an impact on me. Hell, Darth Maul from Phantom Menace left more of an impact on me. Phasma barely leaves much of an impression outside of her look. Unlike Dedra Mira, who is vicious, smart. And her smartness only makes her even more scary. She is willing to make people suffer in order for her to succeed. Now let's go back to Phasma, who barely has much of a motivation for what she does. And your villain is lacking in motivation and only blends into the background you know your villain f is an epic fail. Right back in the mess. Number 
Tarman has the same backstory as Finn. We have a very unusual rebel named Tarman, who is later revealed to us that he is a stormtrooper who left the Empire after witnessing a massacre. Hmm, I wonder why that backstory sounds familiar. I know, it's Finn. I mean, both Tarman and Finn have the same backstory. Although I'll give the sequel some credit for actually showing us the massacre. And for having Finn do some cool stuff, like fighting a stormtrooper with a lightsaber. And for having Finn lead a troop into battle in Rise of Skywalker. While Finn is more jovial and lighthearted, Tarman is more reserved. He's also very cautious, not always willing to trust everyone easily. He's pretty much everything Finn should have been. And unlike Finn, Finn's character in the sequels is neglected. Tarman is put to good use. You are right back in the mess. Number two, a spy. In Rise of Skywalker, it's revealed that General Hux is a spy. Yep, he's just a spy. And we don't know how long he's been a spy. And the only reason he has for being a spy is because he doesn't like Kylo Ren. Because, yeah, risking your entire military career is worth the, all that. Oh, well, I guess it doesn't matter because he ends up getting shot anyways. There's a very similar subplot with Lieutenant Gordon. And on Like Hux, we actually get some foreshadowing to this. We see him visiting the Rebels. And when it's finally revealed by the Empire that he's a spy for the Rebel Alliance, he's pretty much told, you'll be hanged for this. And he says, after working for you for many years, I deserve worse. You are right back in the mess. And the number one way that Andor succeeds where the sequels fail is... Andy Serkis playing Kino Lloyd. Now let's talk about the best character in all of Andor, Kino freaking Lloyd, played wonderfully by Andy Serkis. And as most of you Star Wars fans already know, he also played Snoke. And boy, did he ever play Snoke. He was chilling. He commanded a presence on screen. And Kino Lloyd, on the other hand, also commanded a great presence whenever he was on screen. He's a prisoner, but he's in a position where he's in charge, 
and the scenes with him are pretty damn intense and can be very brutal. And he sacrifices himself. He makes the ultimate sacrifice for his men, knowing that he cannot make it out. But on the off chance he doesn't make it out, at least he goes out with a bang, unlike Snoke, who goes out with a whimper. Well, that's the end of my video. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Henry R. Mockingbird, your host with the mustache, signing off. And have a happy May 4th, Star Wars fans.